Good morning, Sobel Church. My name is Dave. Thanks for joining us today for our online gathering. We have an awesome worship set coming to us from the meeting house this morning. I'm so thankful for that family there. Uh, Chris will be here in just a minute to wrap up our series called Grateful that we've been looking at for the last few weeks. If you've missed any of those weeks, head over to uh, our YouTube page and all the playlists are set up there. You can catch up on everything that you missed. Uh, Before we do all of that, though, let's uh, pause and take just a few minutes for our weekly updates. Last weekend, while we were here in person and online, we had an opportunity, a special giving opportunity uh, over Thanksgiving. We wanted to just make sure that you knew uh, that as those givings are still trickling in, that we've left that as an available option on sobblechurch.ca slash giving. Just hit the drop down menu and you'll find that as an option for giving there too. So if you thought maybe you had missed an opportunity there, feel free. It's right there still and live even now. Prayer is one of the things that we love to do here at the church. In fact, our church, Sobel Church, was founded right out of a prayer meeting. And so here we are continuing on that legacy and what an awesome legacy that is. We have a couple of prayer groups that meet regularly through the week here at Sobel Church. I'll put the information here on the screen for you to check out. If you're interested in being part of that, you're always welcome. If we have to move to a larger uh, space and a larger space because there's so many people praying at those times, we can do that. If there's a better time that you would like to see uh, that you would gather with other people, then why don't you let us know that as well at info at sobblechurch.ca. Prayer.sobblechurch.ca is where you can go and give us your requests and also your praise items so that we can be joining with you in prayer and praise uh, throughout the week, both at our groups and in our staff meeting all over the place. We want to be standing together in prayer. So take advantage of that. Mid-October is when we start thinking about the board nominations for the following year, and so it's that time again even now. We want you to be prayerfully considering who you might nominate for some of the available board positions and head over to sobblechurch.ca slash nomination and give us their name so we can be prayerfully considering and going to chat with them as well about that. Uh, We want God to build an awesome team and we need your help as well. So prayerfully uh, consider who you might nominate and then head over to the website and let us know. As we wrap up our current series this morning called Grateful, we're looking forward to a small mini-series, a two-week mini-series starting next Sunday, both in person and online, called First Love. We want to look at a couple different things that are uh, happening through Scripture that just draw us towards the Father. And so let's do that together as we start that next weekend. November 13th, we want to gather together for a very special Sunday morning, both in person and live streamed online, uh, as we look at the ongoing ministry of Pastor Dave Brotherton. And so we're so excited to be able to do that. Uh, Looking forward to hearing from a bunch of different voices throughout a ministry career that has gone for decades and a very fruitful one at that. Join us, mark it on your calendar, November 13th, and be available to be part of that. We'll be having guests from all over the country, really all over the world, joining us that morning. And so we're looking forward to that. November 13th, celebrating the ongoing ministry of Pastor Dave Brotherton. As always, if you're interested in partnering with us in ministry through giving, uh, we would welcome you to do that. Head over to sobblechurch.ca slash giving to find out more information on the five simple ways that we have set up for you to do exactly that. We want to continue to be a generous people, and we want to be prayerfully motivated for how God would have us do that. And as he blesses us, we bless others. So let's do that. That's it for our weekly updates. As we gather both in person and online today, would you be blessed by what is coming? And God, would you be made famous through this? We just pray that with all of our hearts. We want to transition now into a time of worship, and we're so thankful for our brothers and sisters down at the Meeting House who are providing our worship experience this morning for us here online. This is exclusive to us here online, and so we're happy that we are able to take advantage of that and join with them. Now, some of the songs might be a little bit unfamiliar. That's okay. The lyrics will be on the screen. Let's use this time to worship, of course, but maybe even just reading those uh, lyrics and just training our mind on who God is as we do that. helping us to be grateful as we come to the throne room this morning. And I don't know, maybe God will present things to us as we go through this time. But let's just pause everything else around in our world and focus in on who he is this morning. And once again, thank you, Meeting House, for helping us with that. Let me pray for us before we do that, and then we'll go to video on that as well. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning and the opportunity that we have to gather uh, in this unique way from all the different places, all the different living rooms, uh, all the different cars, all the different whatever uh, to gather even right now and to call on your name. 
So as we join together in worship this morning, would you be pleased? Would you find this to be a sweet sound in your ear? And then would you just uh, come and bless us through that? God, we give you everything that's about to happen. And we love you. We want to hear from you this morning to help us to eliminate all the unfocused bits and really just dial in on you this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Um, Happy Thanksgiving. We are so happy that you're here. Um, We're going to spend a few times in musical worship, so feel free to stand and worship with us however you feel the need this morning. together and get to hear other voices 
and just to be able to come as we are is such a gift and I recognize that even though it's Thanksgiving and there's so much to celebrate that we're all walking in with different things coming from different places but God meets us where we're at and when we when we show up God will move so if we make the space if we give him the room he's already here and so God we invite you into this space we invite you into our worship that we we offer up to you God as um yeah, as an offering, we give you this time. We ask you, um, we ask you to remind us that we are yours, and that there's nothing that can can separate us from you. Um, and we thank you for your spirit. And as we sing this song, God, we we sing it together with one voice as a family, alongside one another in community, which is such a gift. So thank you for this time together. And would you just be here working, God? Come out of sadness wherever you've been. Come brokenhearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. So lay down your burden, lay down your shame. Oh, who are broken? Lift up.
also to make us new, to remind us of what we have to celebrate, to remind us of where our joy comes from, even joy in a trial, which is the real gift, being able to find comfort and peace in that trial, but also being able to celebrate and trust where God is leading us and, and becoming who he's created us to be.
Well, hello and uh, welcome again to our SCF Online teaching time. So today is going to be part four of four of this little series that we've been in called Grateful. And uh, we've talked about what it looks like to be filled with gratitude. A gratitude that is tethered to the character of God. And God is always good. He's always loving. He's always gracious and faithful. And um, so we can be filled with gratitude even when we personally are kind of having a bad day. We've talked about this thing of being filled with gratitude and and what does that look like um, in terms of generosity? Uh, so overflowing gratitude that reveals itself in generosity. And then we talked about overflowing gratitude that reveals itself in praise. And uh, today we want to think about this thing of gratitude, overflowing gratitude that reveals itself in contentment. And we don't talk a lot about contentment. And chances are you've never read a book on contentment. When we do talk about contentment, we tend to talk about it in terms of our, our stuff, in terms of our standard of living. And uh, that's a really easy thing to do for us in the West in the 21st century because we have a lot of stuff. We are rich. And so sometimes our contentment really has to do a lot with our possessions. And, you know, for many of us, we literally don't need a thing. And the problem with not needing a thing is that our contentment can be just confined to our stuff and it can actually kind of push Jesus out of the way. And we can actually begin to live as if we don't need him. You know, when Jesus, when Jesus said it is harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, he was talking about us. We're that rich man. We're that rich woman. Did you know that 80% of the world's population today lives on the equivalent of 20 Canadian dollars a day or less. And a significant uh, portion of the world's population lives on the equivalent of two Canadian dollars per day or less. We in the West are rich. If you are a single Canadian adult and you have a you have an income of $55,000 after tax, you are in the top 2% of wage earners globally. We are rich. Well, Paul um, wrote about this to Timothy. And uh, this is 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning at verse 17. Paul writes to Timothy. Timothy's a young pastor in Ephesus. Command those who are rich in this present world. By the way, that's us. We're the ones who are rich in this present world. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Statistically speaking, we are the ones who are rich in this present world. Maybe you've uh, read some uh, of the book of Revelation, maybe you've read it all, maybe you've read it multiple times. You might know that in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, we find there seven letters. Seven letters written by Jesus to seven actual local churches of Asia Minor. And in these seven letters, Jesus is essentially evaluating these churches. 
And he follows kind of the same pattern with all seven of these letters. He addresses each church uh, individually. Then he commends them. Then he reproves them. And then he urges them to overcome the challenges that they're facing. What's interesting is two of the letters have no reproof, only commendation. Now, that's the kind of church uh, I want to be a part of. That's the kind of church uh, we all want SCF Online to be and Sable Christian Fellowship to be. And, what, and maybe you have a, uh, have, a, have a church that you attend in person, and that's the kind of church you want to be part of, a church where Jesus only has good things to say. One of the churches, uh, one of these seven churches has no commendation, only reproof. Now that catches our attention, doesn't it? And we might ask, you know, what, what kind of church is it where Jesus literally has nothing good to say about it? Only reproof. And the reproof that this one church has that has no commendation, the reproof is like the most stinging reproof of all of the reproof in these uh, letters. And some of the other churches where Jesus offers reproof, um, it's not small things he's quibbling about. Some of the other churches have kind of welcomed in some false teaching. Some of the churches had kind of compromised with the um, uh, kind of embracing the sensuality of their culture. Not insignificant things, but the one reproof of this one church that has no commendation is the most stinging reproof of, uh, of all. And this one church that we're uh, going to talk about today is the church at Laodicea. And so let's begin by reading uh, this letter to the church at Laodicea. If you have your Bible, uh, you can have it open to Revelation chapter 3. And uh, we're going to begin at verse 14. This is the letter uh, of Jesus to the church at Laodicea. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Say this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If you've been a part of church world uh, for any length of time, it's possible and perhaps even likely that you have heard this passage used in kind of a like a revival sort of context. Uh, maybe a preacher says something like, hey, you know what's wrong with the church in Canada today? It's cold, it's apathetic, and, and we need to get fired up for God. We need to get fired up for Jesus. We're cold. We need to get hot for God. Uh, and with all due respect uh, to that sort of message, that is not, in fact, what Jesus is trying to get across here. Really, in order to understand, I think, what uh, Jesus is, in fact, saying to this church in Laodicea, we need to understand some geography. Um, you know, we often talk about studying the scripture in context, and uh, one contextual 
uh, consideration is geography, and in this case, it's a really helpful consideration. Laodicea um, was very strategically located. It was located along some major uh, trade routes, and so it was a, a terrific location, and so essentially the whole world of that time had to travel through Laodicea. Here's a little map uh, kind of giving you an idea of some of these trade routes and the strategic location of Laodicea. Notice also its proximity to Heropolis and Colossae. Um, higher, Heropolis and Colossae are, you know, less than 20 kilometers from Laodicea. So this, these three cities form kind of a tri-city uh, area. Here is uh, just a picture of some of the excavation that has taken place at Laodicea, a fabulously wealthy city, incredibly wealthy. So if you were in the first century and you wanted to buy a Lamborghini, uh, the dealership would be in Laodicea. If you wanted to buy some Gucci shoes or a Prada bag, uh, you'd have to go to Laodicea because that's where those stores were. Um, here's... Um, uh, I, I should point out that um, although Laodicea was indeed a fabulously wealthy city, it had one major problem. It had no water. And uh, the nearest source of water to Laodicea was about eight kilometers away. That's where the nearest uh, underground well or aquifer was. And so um, what happened was the, the water got piped into Laodicea from uh, about eight kilometers away through a, a system of pipes or aqueducts. And uh, here's, here's what that uh, looked like. This is literally a Laodicean uh, aqueduct. And that's how the water uh, traveled eight kilometers to get to Laodicea. And as you can imagine, this is a hot climate. And so by the time uh, water travels through these uh, these aqueducts, eight kilometers, by the time it gets to Laodicea, it is no longer cold and refreshing. It is, as the text said, lukewarm. And archaeologists have uncovered a lot of this uh, pipe in the area of Laodicea that was used to transport water. And what they noted inside these um, pipes was the high degree of, of sediment um, uh, there was evidence that every so often along these pipes there were access ports for people to, to be able to maintain and to scrape out all of the, the buildup of, of uh, minerals and so on. And so by the time the water uh, got to Laodicea, not only was it lukewarm, but it also um, was calcified and sulfurated. It would have tasted horrible, and it would have smelled probably like rotten eggs, if you've ever smelled kind of rotten egg water. And so Jesus, in this letter, really is speaking into their specific context with what they had to deal with every day. Um, they knew exactly what Jesus was talking about because they hated their water. Um, we showed that little map showing the proximity of Laodicea to Heropolis and also to Colossae. Here's a, here's a picture of the region of Colossae. Colossae was located kind of in the foothills of these uh, mountains, and they received their water from the snow melt. And so it was cold and refreshing and clear and sweet and uh, wonderful. Here's a picture of Heropolis, and Heropolis was famous for its hot springs. Uh, that, they were famous in the, in the first century, and still today, tourists flock to the area of Heropolis. And here is a, a picture, it's a fairly modern picture of the hot springs there, and people would go and uh, would uh, soak in these hot springs for their uh, healing and therapeutic value. So as you think about that, you can kind of begin to get a sense of what Jesus is getting at. Jesus says, I wish that you were cold or hot. He's saying, I wish you were cold, like the cold, 
refreshing and wonderful water of Colossae. Or, I wish you were hot and healing and therapeutic and helpful, like the hot water of Heropolis. But quite frankly, Jesus says, you are like your water. You are lukewarm and distasteful. And Jesus, it's as if Jesus says, and you know that feeling that you get when you drink your water? Well, that's how I feel about you. Pretty stinging uh, reproof from Jesus. So rather than this being a passage that says, hey, you're cold, you need to get hot for God. Uh, no, Jesus is saying, I wish you were cold or hot. And Jesus goes on in the letter to describe really what the, what the problem is. Um, you're distasteful, you're lukewarm, you're not hot like Heropolis, you're cold like Colossae, so I will spit you out of my mouth. Why? Why such stinging reproof? Well, here's why. Because you say, Jesus writes, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. Because of their prosperity and their wealth, they think they don't even need Jesus. They are living as if they don't need Jesus. And so you can see why Jesus is so concerned with this church and why he offers no commendation, only this stinging reproof. And you can see the danger that is inherent in prosperity. You know, not a thing wrong with prosperity, not a thing wrong with wealth, not a thing wrong with success. But you can see that uh, inherent in that prosperity is the danger uh, that it can blind us to just how desperately we need Jesus, uh, prosperity can kind of uh, lure us to a contentment with our stuff, but to actually push Jesus out of the way. Think back to that little map that we uh, had on the screen, the, uh, the strategic location of Laodicea. Again, it was an incredibly affluent city. All of the trade routes went through Laodicea, and it uh, was the banking center for the whole region. So it was a financial hub, um, and so uh, very prosperous just in that sense alone. Plus, it had a very advanced uh, like textile uh, industry. They had black sheep uh, there, and so they had this incredible black wool, and they made these incredible linens and clothing and so on that were uh, really sought after worldwide, and so uh, that was a significant source of revenue, and uh, uh, they were very famous for that. Plus, they had this kind of, uh, really like a pharmaceutical uh, component to their economy, uh, and one of the, one of the most um, prosperous products that they had was this ISAV that was developed with minerals that were um, uh, regional to Laodicea, and this ISAV was said to have some um, really restorative and healing kind of uh, properties to it. And so um, it was an extremely affluent city. Uh, Laodicea had two theaters. Uh, now that doesn't sound like much, uh, but if you think about, uh, think about Ephesus, Ephesus had one theater. Uh, and Ephesus was a much, much larger city. Ephesus was like, like the Toronto uh, of its day. And so, uh, so Ephesus had one theater, Laodicea much, much, much smaller had two. Um, and so, you know, here's, here's kind of the mentality or the mindset of the city. I am rich, I've become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. The whole city uh, kind of held that philosophy, including the church, including the Christians. Laodicea was um, virtually leveled by an earthquake in AD 17. And uh, kind of like today, like recently, of course, 
uh, Hurricane Fiona uh, created so much damage in the Atlantic provinces. And so what happens uh, and what happened, uh, you know, in, in Canada here, you get representatives from the federal government who travel to the Atlantic provinces. They've got their clipboards, they've got their calculators, they've got their checkbooks. And it's like, okay, uh, what's it going to take to, uh, to fix this up? And so I think last week, even there was a package of $300 million announced to help the Atlantic Atlantic provinces uh, rebuild and recover and uh, from from the damage of this hurricane. Well, similarly in AD 17, when Laodicea is leveled by an earthquake, representatives from um, the Roman government, so uh, representatives leave Rome and head to Laodicea and they've got their checkbooks and their clipboards and their calculators and they say, okay, how much is it going to take to rebuild? And guess what the Laodicean said? No thanks. We're good. We've got this. We don't need a thing. And they took no money from Rome and they rebuilt their city entirely uh, on their own. So their prosperity had, had brought them to a place, even the Christians, to a place where they felt no need uh, of Jesus in their lives. They, they had everything they needed. They didn't even need Jesus, and they lived that way. There's a number of warnings uh, all through Scripture about really the dangers of prosperity. And again, nothing wrong with prosperity. Nothing wrong with being wealthy and successful, but there's a danger inherent in it. You might remember, if you've read through uh, the book of Deuteronomy, I believe it's in chapter 8, where God issues a warning to the Israelites before they uh, enter into the promised land. He says, when you get into the promised land, when you see wells that you did not dig, when you see vineyards that you did not plant, when you see houses that you did not build, be careful, lest you forget the Lord your God. Uh, the dangers inherent in prosperity and the things that we have. And so Jesus in this letter goes on to say, um, you know, they've said, uh, we're, we're wealthy, we've got need of nothing. And then Jesus says, well, let me tell you how I see it. From where I sit, in my sight, you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. And I think one of the things that we need to grab onto is that God is indeed the author of prosperity. You know, we read in the scripture in James that every good and perfect gift comes from him. Every good thing that we have comes from God. So he's the author of prosperity, but his definition of prosperity uh, so often is different from ours. One story that I like from the life of Jesus, and, and, and frankly, I like them all, uh, but this one is, is a good one. And it's uh, found in Luke chapter 12, and it goes like this. Someone in the crowd said to him, that is to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard, against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. By the time you get to this story, to Luke chapter 12, Jesus is incredibly uh, famous. Uh, huge crowds are following him everywhere he goes. And so here's a, a very unique scenario where there's a, a, a huge crowd surrounding Jesus. And somehow in the midst of this crowd, Jesus and this other guy lock eyes. And it's almost as if the crowd quiets and uh, there's a spotlight on this guy and he's got the microphone and it's his one shot to say something to Jesus. And so he says, Jesus, I want more money. Tell my brother to give me more money. He's cheated me. I want him to give me more money. And you know, I hope, I would hope that if you get one shot to say something to Jesus, it would be better than that. Um, I like to think that if I had one shot to say something to Jesus and I had the mic and the light was on me and everybody was, was listening, 
I would like to think that I would just say something so profound to Jesus that Jesus would go, hmm, never really thought of that before. Let's sit down and talk about that. That's usually the point where I would wake up, right? But Jesus says to this guy, beware of greed. A man's life, a woman's life, does not consist in the abundance of the things that they possess. Such a counterintuitive statement by Jesus. And see how he um, redefines prosperity. A, a person's life does not consist in the abundance of their possessions. Jesus immediately told a story um, to this crowd, to this guy. And the story is about a wealthy farmer. And uh, here it is. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. And so here's this uh, farmer. Uh, he has a huge harvest. He's so excited about it. Tears down his barns, builds huge big barns to, to store this enormous harvest. He's so happy, throws a party, invites his friends, invites his neighbors and says, oh, tonight is going to be a good night. And, uh, you know, eat, drink and be merry. Let's celebrate. But uh, somebody shows up to the party, uh, a party crasher, uh, somebody who wasn't invited, namely God, shows up at the party and says to this guy, tonight your life will be demanded of you. And then whose stuff will will this be? And God actually calls him a fool, not because he's wealthy, not because he's prosperous. God's never against that. But he calls him a fool because he says, you're not rich toward God. And really, that was the, the problem. This farmer had defined his wealth in his stuff rather than in his relationship with God. I want to just come back to one verse. We've already looked at it uh, just because it's so uh, instructive for us. This is 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. And again, uh, Paul writing to uh, young Timothy, a pastor. And he says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. I think it's notable that Paul here affirms wealth. He affirms prosperity. Again, nothing wrong with that. But he says, tell those who are rich not to put their trust in the uncertainty of riches. I think one of the, th one of the takeaways, I hope, among many uh, takeaways from the last two and a half years of living through um, this season of COVID is I hope we've seen the uncertainty of riches. Don't put your trust in the uncertainty of riches. Don't be conceited or just content because you've got a lot of stuff. And, and, and Paul goes on, and we already read it, but he goes on to say, be rich in good works, be hospitable, be willing to share, be willing to bless those who have less than you. That's the, that's the definition. That's how God sees our wealth. That's how God sees our riches, and that's how he measures it. And so um, he says to these, uh, Jesus says to these Laodiceans back in Revelation again, to these Laodiceans who had become so self-sufficient. Really, that's the, that's the sin of self-sufficiency. Living like we really don't need him. And so Jesus goes on to say, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be 
zealous and repent. And so it's like Jesus is saying, hey, you guys clearly love stuff. You clearly love to shop. So I want to invite you to come and buy from me things that you desperately need and you can't get them anywhere else. And so he says, come and buy from me gold that's been refined by fire. And anytime you have that uh, imagery in scripture, gold refined by fire, it's talking about character, the refining of our character, the gold of a person's character. And this is something that Jesus does. This is the transforming work that Jesus does in our lives from the inside out, making us more and more to be like him, making us more and more to be the person that we really want to be deep down and that uh, to, to become the person that our spouse and our kids desperately uh, need us to be. It's character. And you can't get that anywhere else, only from Jesus. And so he says, come and uh, buy that from me. You can't get it anywhere else. And then he says, um, uh, come and buy from me white robes. And anytime you see that imagery of white robes, particularly in relation to us, uh, it's speaking about righteousness. And, and uh, so Jesus is saying, hey, uh, come and get righteousness from me. You can't get it anywhere else. And then he says, come and buy an ointment, a salve for your eyes so that you may see. Kind of the idea is you're blind, so come and buy ointment from me so that you can see. Notice how Jesus is talking right into their context. They're incredibly wealthy. So Jesus says, come and buy from me gold so that you might become rich. They had this textile industry. So he says, come and buy from me white clothing. And they had this pharmaceutical thing. So come and buy from me this eye salve so that you can see. See what? Uh, maybe to see ourselves as we really are. That without Jesus, if we push him out of the way, that really without him we're poor and wretched and blind and naked. Maybe to see the world the way that Jesus sees the world, that we would see it through his eyes. And maybe to see his wisdom, maybe to see the needy and the poor and the marginalized as in need of compassion and in need of the love of Jesus. Maybe to see our enemies, not as objects of revenge, but as objects of love and forgiveness, much like when we were enemies of God, he extended to us love and forgiveness. You only get that kind of perspective, that kind of vision uh, from Jesus. And so he says, come um, and I'll give that to you. He closes the letter with verse 20, which says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Such interesting uh, imagery. And I want you to kind of think about that, visualize that. Here's this church of Laodicea, wealthy, don't need a thing. They've, in their contentment with their stuff, they've expressed discontent, as it were, with Jesus, and they've pushed him out. They're blinded to just how desperately they need him, and they've pushed him right out of the church so that Jesus is outside, knocking, wanting to come in. Think about that image, and then compare it to another image of Jesus, again, from the book of Revelation, chapter 1, and I'm going to read just a few verses. This is Revelation, chapter 1. Of course, John... Um, pens the revelation, and in Revelation 1, he pens this vision of Jesus. Listen to this. These are the words of John. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. 
His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. What a picture. John sees Jesus as this, this conquering king of heaven. And you know, John had seen Jesus a lot. They had hung out together for three and a half years, side by side. But John at no time had ever seen Jesus like this, this incredible, powerful, conquering king of heaven. And then you get to the end of chapter 3, to the end of this letter to the Laodiceans, and here's Jesus, marginalized, standing on the outside, knocking, wanting to come in. That's an incredible contrast. Um, you've perhaps heard this uh, verse used, Revelation 3.20, you've perhaps heard it used in a, like an evangelistic context, but that's really not the context. It's not an evangelistic verse. This is written to us. It's written to Christians. It's written to the church. Because of our self-sufficiency, because perhaps we've succumbed and been seduced uh, by the dangers of prosperity, maybe... Maybe we are living as if we really don't need him. Maybe we're the ones who've kind of pushed him out and marginalized him and sort of locked him on the outside of our lives. And I wonder today, do you, you know, hear the knock of Jesus? We've, we've pushed him out. He's outside, you know, collar up, shoulders hunched against the cold, humbly, not this conquering king of heaven humbly knocking on the, on the door of your heart saying, I want to come in. Well, I wonder, I wonder if we hear that knock today, if, if we'd be willing to open that door um, so that we can see that contentment is not just in our stuff because we're rich, but really about a contentment with him. He says, I'll come in. I'll come in and I'll eat with you. And to eat with someone in the first century was the highest form of fellowship and intimacy and, and relationality. Uh, meals in the first century were two, three hours long. Uh, so unlike meals today. You know, this, this is not like an 11 minute meal where you've got your fork in one hand and your phone in the other hand. No, this is intimacy. This is personal relationship. And that's what Jesus is wanting with you and with me. Will we hear that knock today? Will we open that door and say yes to a contentedness with him? Well, let's pray. Our Father, I pray that you would help us more and more to be a people of gratitude, filled with gratitude, so that when life bumps into us, what spills out is gratitude. And remind us that the gratitude you call us to display is tethered not to our circumstances, which change all the time and go up and down, but rather a gratitude that is tethered to your unchanging character. You are always good and always loving and always full of grace. And because you are all of those things and more, well, we can overflow with gratitude, even when we're having a tough day. And may our gratitude be revealed in our generosity and in our praise and in our contentment 
not merely contentment with what we have because we're rich, because we live in the West in the 21st century and we're somehow self-sufficient, living like we don't need you. No, help us. Help us to become content, Jesus, with you. We hear your knocking and we open the door to you, Jesus, to enjoy your presence and your fellowship and your friendship. Transform us from the inside out more and more into your likeness. And may we live every day with the keen awareness that we desperately need you. Help us to see ourselves the way that you see us, Jesus, clothed in righteousness, your righteousness, and help us to see you clearly and to see the world clearly through your eyes. I lift up each and every one of my SCF Online family to you today. Would you bless and encourage each one in Jesus' name? Amen. God bless. Thanks, Chris, for your awesome words again this morning, and Father, for inspiring Chris to put that all together. Over this past series called Grateful, we have explored a whole lot of uh, things, and there's been some uh, awesome life change that is possible if we hear those words and we apply them to our lives. If you've missed any of those uh, messages throughout the past month or so, head over to the playlist options in our YouTube channel, at Sobel Church, and find that and just catch up. Uh, we'd love for that to happen. It's not just a message series. It's not just a 30 minute talk uh, on a video. It is a call to our lives. And so uh, take advantage of that. Anyway, that's it for us today. Thanks so much for taking time, uh, church, to gather with us. If you're joining us during the premiere, the live chat is happening right now. Hopefully you've been in there uh, chatting it up a little bit. And if you're joining us at any time, whether it's premiere or any other time throughout the, I don't know, coming years, would you take just a moment and like this video? That helps us with sort of the algorithm for YouTube. It also helps us get things out in front of everybody. And it encourages the team that's putting this all together for you. So we'd appreciate that too. That's it for today though. Thanks so much for dropping in. We'll talk to you again next week. Bye.